Uh, hi, Dominique, and um, welcome to a uh, week ahead and key events for, for the upcoming week. And obviously, as we always like to do, we let's have a quick recap for, for last week. And once again, as most weeks have been this year, it was a very uh, eventful week. And obviously, markets rallied a lot uh, as well. So maybe first and foremost, kind of what were your big takeaways from last week? And were you surprised by any of the kind of events or market reactions? So um, obviously, I don't share the market optimism. Uh, I'm not really surprised by the reaction. And there were a couple of things happening. The first one was, you know, the Fed Chair Powell, because he was forced to break his very specific forward guidance for June. This time around was much more cautious. He was a perfect double-handed economist, you know, on the one hand, on the other hand. And of course, the market chose to focus only on the dovish hand, shall we say. So I think they uh, misunderstood uh, his attempt to give himself more policy optionality and credibility for dovishness. And I expect that as we get FOMC speakers and there are only a few next week, even Fed, uh, even the Fed takes a break in the summer, maybe we should too. Um, I think they are going to show that, uh, you know, inflation is still the number one uh, focus of the Fed. So, so there, is, there is that uh, misunderstanding of the Fed reaction function. And then the other thing that happened, uh, and which I think the markets uh, got wrong, is the inflation data in general was worse than expected, uh, in line with my expectations. Uh, however, the GDP data was also much worse than uh, expected, uh, which was not my expectation. But uh, I looked at the data with a fine comb, and I hope our listeners will uh, read my analysis. Mm. Uh, the negative print was largely uh, a combination of uh, a noise, uh, payback for previously very high growth, and one of uh, adjustments uh, to the post-pandemic uh, world. The, the trend remains, remains strong. Um, and obviously, the, once more, the market is not agreeing with me. Um, but I, I, you know, I've looked at the data in detail, and I feel quite confident um, about this view. So, so right now, the market is assuming that the Fed gets to like three, three and a quarter by early yeah. next year, and then starts cutting from there. That's kind of okay. Yeah. Um, and then, what what do you say to people saying, well? The Fed will one if the data just start, inflation data just starts turning that they feel that once that starts turning I guess um, that trend will continue. So I mean inflation coming lower and certainly in public markets underlying say food prices have been coming down, uh, gasoline prices have coming down not a lot. Uh, I guess they've been maybe kind of rallying a bit recently. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would agree with you that it's surprised how aggressive. Uh, I mean, two-year yield, we've seen uh, 60, 70 basis points right in the last kind of four or five weeks. Um, yeah, so interesting. So I guess I had a question first before we uh, dive into I guess the upcoming week. Why haven't the Fed speakers pushed against this more? Or do you think that they will start going back to 50, I guess, targeting September? And they, they are, there is credence to the idea that they think there will be a lag in their policy actions and they will wait to see kind of what that, what that effect is, even though as, as you and other people have been pointing out, because of these moves in interest rates, particularly in even equities, um, liquidity conditions are getting loose again. Um, For sure. 
unless the economy is in a significant recession, like if it's okay and conditions start loosening again, like odds are that the economy should start strengthening again and inflation won't be coming down. Um, so, so I guess the main question is why have Fed speakers not pushed back more against this, even outside of Powell? And do you see that happening in the next few weeks? Or as you mentioned, they're going to give a, they'll be on break and there won't be a lot of um, comments around this. Uh, so first, they are on break. Uh, and then they, um, they are in a difficult situation because uh, their model of inflation uh, has been falsified by the data. So their model of inflation is that as long as inflation expectations are stable, things will take care of themselves. Inflation will be self-correcting. So yeah. that model suggests that indeed, now they should wait and see the impact uh, of the hikes uh, and so slow the pace uh, of hikes. Um, on the other hand, they've been repeatedly surprised by the strength of inflation. Uh, I would argue the model has been falsified by the data because indeed uh, expectations are stable, uh, but inflation is soaring. So they've been wrong so many times that they have lost a bit of confidence in the model. And so they are themselves confused uh, and that's probably uh, why they are hedging. I mean, this is just what Chair Powell did at the last meeting. He he hedged, you know, by uh, by not giving very very specific guidance. So to me, this works well with my big picture and my forecast of eight percent or close to eight percent Fed funds rate, because my forecast is so uh, inconsistent with the Fed model of inflation that in order to get there, I need the Fed to lose confidence in the model. And I think that's what we are seeing right now. Interesting. And so if, if they went 75, 75, 75, we're not getting to 8% because they, they would have shocked the economy pretty significantly. But if they lose confidence a bit and say, well, look, some data is weakening, so you know, maybe we can go back to 50, maybe we even 25 or even pause, that will do force them to go much higher over a longer period of time um, because they're not having that immediate effect um, by being very aggressive, even though they claim that that's what they were going to do. Well, I mean, there is there is no question, and that's what the BIS says, and even the Fed, I think even Chair Powell said so, um, the further you fall behind the curve, the more, more painful uh, the tightening is. I mean, the best example, of course, is the second oil shock and eventually the, the Volcker recession. You know, the Fed did not tighten enough after the first uh, oil shock. So inflation remained around 6%. Then came the second oil shock and inflation jumped to uh, 14%. Uh, percent. And so then the recession that was needed to bring down inflation was the most painful uh, since the 1930s, basically. Yeah. Um, okay. Let, let's go quickly then to the, the week ahead. Um, what are the key things you're thinking? What should it, should our investors, clients be thinking about? So uh, the NFP, I think once more the market uh, is underestimating uh, the strength of the labor market. And it's not just about growth remaining strong, uh, but it's also that real wages are falling. So, you know, if you are a business and you can get hold of uh, workers willing to work at the wages you are offering, you're going to get them. So the market is predicting 250,000, frankly, it seems very low, unless markets know something that I don't know, which is always ah, a possibility, of interesting. course. Interesting. So it Let's just pick a number. So if we say uh, business is profitable, hiring people at $20 an hour, and you can hire people at $20 an hour, um, and you're profitable anywhere below uh, $23, if you can get people at $20, you're going to hire them. 
if we're talking about like a service service business, yeah, you know, definitely. Yeah. So I guess that that's the issue. And if wages are not going up enough, that's not really going to slow that the economy in general, that business from from hiring and growing. Um, a little bit like you were saying about housing. I remember. Um, the, so that now that makes sense. Uh, I, I understand what you're saying. But what one quick thing I want to say is. Um, you know, some people point to things like housing or even employment as being kind of lagging indicators. It takes a while for, for some of these things. Um, are there things you look at to, to make sure you're, you're not focusing on kind of more potentially lagging indicators? If, if you do view things like uh, wages or something as a lagging indicator. So I think that's a very fair point, but one thing to keep in mind is that the US market, labor market is amazingly uh, flexible. And that at the first uh, hint uh, of a slowdown, workers get laid off. And um, in fact, what happens, but it's not always the case. What happened with the pandemic is that uh, usually when there is a big downturn, firms lay off workers, but they keep more workers than they need. And you have, so you have a loss of uh, labor productivity uh, simply because firms uh, know that it's costly uh, to hire workers. And if they fire everybody, it will cost them a lot of money to bring, to hire back the workers that they need when the economy normalizes. And this time around with the pandemic, uh, the opposite happened. There was actually an increase in productivity um, and uh, unemployment jumped very high. So, I mean, there is no question that, uh, you know, as, as an analyst, you always have the risk of a bias of looking only at the data that uh, uh, meets your expectations. Um, so, I, I mean, I do my uh, monitoring thinking in terms of, uh, you know, what is the big picture? Yeah. And the big picture there is that uh, we still have uh, data that is, um, we still have special circumstances that are supporting growth. Like for instance, uh, the decline in the savings rate. Uh, the savings rate has, I don't think it's, ever, it's been so low until just before the GFC, but it's extremely low. And it simply reflects the fact that the payoff from the government during the pandemic were enormous and they are still being uh, spent. And then you have a couple of things uh, like credit growth, which is you know, accelerating very, uh, very strongly. Uh, that are also- Business or individuals? Both, uh, business uh, even faster than individual. And so um, those things are, are, keep, are keeping growth running. So back to your question of uh, leading indicators, the so-called leading indicators, I mean, out of experience, tend not to be very leading, actually, <laughs> uh, and tend to be usually, I'm thinking OECD, conference board, uh, those uh, tend to be coincident, coincident or, you know, at best, most time lagging indicators, especially since they tend to be adjusted after the, the facts. Um, so, I, I tend to monitor the economy thinking more in terms of the big picture and what are the key things I need to see in order for my big picture story to happen. And the savings rate uh, is definitely uh, one of those key drivers of my uh, positive view on the, on the economy. Right. You know, something else interesting, I, I, I remember all the exact data, but I feel like uh, employment in Europe, as an example, is, is still pretty strong, even in places like Germany. And in Europe, you can imagine the cost of hiring and firing is much worse than the US. No question. Much less flexible of a system. So in order for companies to say they want to hire in Europe, for Germany as an example, they have to be pretty confident that business is okay. And everyone's saying, oh, you know, Europe is in such a horrible place. The data doesn't look that terrible. Um, so I guess let, let's kind of see how those that stuff kind of plays out as well. Um, but 
you know, for sure. Uh, on the other hand, Europe is more exposed to President Putin cutting off yes, energy as supplies. Yes, did a great thing there. Which but, I cannot that. recommend strongly enough, but our listeners uh, read it's super important. Uh, Europe is going through a really uh, secular changes. Um, and if you look at European and US inflation, it's about the same. So I suspect market is underestimating the amount of tightening that's needed in, in the Eurozone, even more so than in the US. I, th- I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, 10-year yield in Germany at 85 basis points, I mean, yeah, and inflation is like 8%, 9%. I, I mean, and, and they've been going down. So, so um, okay, so any, any specific, I know uh, a lot of people are traveling, other stuff, uh, you know, the next two weeks, but any specific data that people should be looking out for in the U.S.? Um, so we have the uh, ISM PMIs, uh, and but I mean, it's one of those indicators that's been uh, distorted by the pandemic in the sense that the pandemic, the, the downturn and up, upturn were exceptionally uh, violent. So it, it's, it's changed a lot of things, um, a lot of relationship between the economy and indicators. I would say, uh, for the, IS, the ISM, I am looking for uh, manufacturing to remain weaker than services simply because of the dollar strength. Uh, but otherwise, you know, the market is expecting a, a small uh, slowdown, a small decline. To me, anything above 50 is, uh, is good. It's okay, yeah. Okay, yeah, I see. So, and services continue to be a bit higher. Um, in manufacturing. And then I guess the only, well, like, because we see it every week, and I remember from like JPM days that looking at jobless, initial jobless claims was kind of one of the more maybe forward thinking or kind of real time ish type data. I guess what, like, we get to near 300, even though, by the way, historically that's still like not bad numbers. But if you get, over 300, which I'm assuming we won't this week, but um, I guess that's another thing that would spook the markets. Oh, definitely. And I mean, that's another thing that's really making it so hard to read the data. Uh, We have, you know, we have shocks, what I call the air pocket. Um, But then we also have a slowdown uh, of growth to to trend. And so what we have here is a uh, claims uh, normalizing, going to where they were uh, before the pandemic, so about you know 250, 300,000, um, and uh, yeah, so it makes you know the question is will it go beyond that? I don't think so, but I'm open to being wrong as always. Um, but uh, yeah, so definitely uh, something to you know keep okay. front and center on the radar on the radar screen screen. Uh, last question I had was this uh, climate change, uh, I guess it's only climate healthcare budget reduction initiative. Um, is, does this have any bearing on the equities, fixed income dollar in the short term? Well, let's see if it happens because the bill is not an enormous amount of money. It's $739 billion over 10 years for 10, 20, what is it, 22 trillion economy. So we're not talking about big money, but what could be significant uh, would be allowing uh, Medicare to negotiate drug prices. So if you are a pharmaceutical company right now, you're not very happy about the the deal. So consequences, uh, short term could be concentrated in the pharmaceutical sector, Long term, it would be very positive for the economy, productivity. I mean, for on, on lots of uh, on lots of levels. Right, right. So, so, so in very short term, maybe uh, positive for healthcare costs coming down slightly. Definitely. So, which means lower labor costs, uh, which means lower insurance costs. 
uh, more money in people's money, uh, more demand for labor, uh, more efficient pharmaceutical industry, and so on and so right. forth. So if this goes through, which is not clear because we still need Senator Cinema to uh, support it, and apparently uh, Schumer and Manchin negotiated with, without involving her at all. So, you know, I, I'm, I keep hoping for this boring summer week, but we still have, we, we could still have a, a surprise next week. But if it happens, yeah, it could be a, the start yes. of a much more, of, well, of a more, not much more, more efficient healthcare system for, for us Americans. Good. Good. Anything else? Uh... That uh, that's just time to be thinking of it this coming week. No, I, I would like to wish everybody a sort of a easy week because uh, what a ride it's been. Uh, so hopefully we get our summer break next week. Okay, cool. All right, thank you so much, Dominique. Thank you to um, all our investors, clients, um, you know, for uh, for listening to this. Hopefully you're enjoying it. As always, please reach out. Any thoughts? Uh, feedback, insights, you know, join the community, uh, participate in the community, and, uh, and have a nice weekend and a great week ahead.